Uh, well, I I just love the Lord of the Rings and Tolkien. That's my favorite. And the other question you had about your favorite legend, that's what I was going to say. Um, I've... I've always, um, I mean, I've always loved reading. I haven't always thought of being a writer, um, but I read um, The Lord of the Rings for the first time at, uh, I know, I think I was about 12 or something. And I've read them many, many times, countless times, um, and can quote from memory <laughs> passages. And uh, A Hobbit is just like, um, A Hobbit in The Lord of the Rings is just like a person now, like a, a, a human being, um, uh, just kind of regular, not heroic, not like rich and famous or not mm. a king. You know, the um, hobbits are just the little people, the regular people. And um, they li they enjoy the beauty of nature and the simple good things of life. And I don't know, I, I always kind of, when I read The Lord of the Rings, I pictured myself as a hobbit, not as one of the elves or other kinds of characters. I think that's great. Well, welcome everybody. Today we're joined by Sister Maria Grace. Is it Datino? How do you pronounce uh, we it? We say it Datino. Datino. Okay. Mm -hmm. She's a member of the Daughters of St. Paul. She loves to read, write, edit books for kids. She's also the author of the Gospel Time Trekkers uh, series. So looking forward to chatting about all of that. Um, thanks for coming on with us today, Sister. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Sure thing. Uh, this is the Catholic Author Show. It's the show about fiction for the modern Catholic authors. We're talking creed, craft, and co-creation rooted in grit, grace, gods, and dragons, if we can squeeze them in. I'm your host, Dominic de Souza, novel, lover, all-around creative, founder of Catholic Author. We're here to inspire your faith and your fiction. All right, sister, can we, uh, I'd like to hear your own origin story and, and how you discern the religious life before we uh, get into the gospel time trekkers and writing fiction and such. So what's your origin story? Um, I, I thought of being a sister off and on from a young age because the first time I ever saw a sister was at my school when I went to kindergarten. There were, there were really only a couple sisters left at the school, but one of them's name was Sister Maria Immaculata. And my name is Maria. That's my baptism name. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, we have the same name. That means I could be a sister too. Um, not knowing that half the sisters in the world have Maria as their name. But um, that was just like the first time. And then I didn't think of it. I, I was, you know, I wanted to get married, have a lot of kids. I love math and science. Um, and I thought of doing something like that. But like once in a while, the thought would come back. And in high school, definitely, I started thinking seriously. But I didn't know any sisters um, that were, that I felt like, attracted to. I There were some poor Claire's near where I lived, and um, I'm from Springfield, Virginia. And um, I thought they were really cool. But when I got older, I was like, no, I don't feel called to, uh, you know, contemplative, cloistered, religious. Um, I didn't really want to be a teacher. I, I didn't want to have anything to do with the medical profession. <laughs> mm. I knew that. So no, no, no sisters. I knew that they did like nursing and stuff like that. So I was like, what else is there? And then when I met our sisters for the first time, I was like, oh, oh, this is different. Like, I really could understand because I love to read. I could understand how a book, a good book could do good for someone, could change someone's life, could help them. So, um, I, you know, and then I visited and felt at home and all the other things. So I entered right out of high school and into the postulancy. What is the charism of, of your order for those who don't know? Um, the Daughters of St. Paul, we were founded um, to communicate Jesus in the whole in the world of communications to spread him through the media and in the whole world um, and our founder said every new invention that comes along so at the time that he started us there was the actually the word media was not a thing um, it was the press and the beginning of radio and film and he said every new invention that comes along we need to be there the church needs to be using these means that at the time other people were using to spread you know atheism and wrong ideas about God and the church and the person kind of like mm -hmm. today. Um, and so he said when people would be speaking out against the press or against films or whatever, but he was like, no, they're gifts from God. Like that human in invention has been able to come up with these ways of communicating. They're mm -hmm. not evil things that should be condemned, but they should be used. So we just mm -hmm. want to get Jesus into that whole world. I think that's, that, what an exciting mission. So now I've got to sort of sidebar and ask, is there 
technologies that are, are emerging or already there that people are still getting used to that you're also getting into? Like, I'm just thinking um, AR and VR or some of the other fun things that are being created. We're, are you all well, testing we're, that? Or? Well, we're, we're always trying to, um, we're, we're always trying to discern what to use and what to do because you can do everything. Right, um, right. but we're, no, we're not like, uh, I don't, I don't think we're really on that cutting edge of, a, of things. Okay. We're definitely in all kinds of, um, social media and, mm-hmm. you know, TikTok and, you know, there's like, we're, we're trying to keep up with things, but, um, I, I don't think we're doing all the, uh, latest stuff yeah yeah i've heard a little bit like i don't even know too much about it but i've heard a little bit about that but okay well that's fun that's fun well tell you what i i'd love to hear about um uh, you'd mentioned a a key factor in your discernment was the um well the charism of the order Mm -hmm. and its focus on the written word and so on Mm -hmm. um had you done much writing Growing up, or were you more of a reader? Um, yeah, I, I really, I don't remember doing a whole lot of writing or thinking like I want to be a writer. I loved reading. I read a lot. Um, I think I often reread things that I liked. You know, um, mm-hmm. I, I did re- not that long ago clearing out stuff in my parents' house. I did find like a notebook from second grade full of little stories with illustrations. So oh, I mean, wow. I did do so. I had forgotten about it. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think mostly it was, um, from reading. And then in our community, I got asked to work as the editor of a kid's magazine that we used to have, excuse Mm -hmm. me. Um, it was called my friend, the Catholic magazine for kids. And it's been um, discontinued a while now. Um, and went, so as the editor of that magazine, I had to really immerse myself in children's literature and books and film and everything. And, um, Mm-hmm. And that's how I got kind of more into thinking about writing for kids. So how long have you been writing the Gospel Time Trekkers then? Um, well, the, they're, they're, it's a complete series. It's, um, there, were six, there were six books in the series. I wrote, it all, I wrote it all pretty fast, and then it took me many years of editing. But they are all, they're all out. It's, it's a finished series. But I, um, I've been working for a while on a follow-up series. So um, I keep thinking if I tell enough people that I'm doing it, that it will actually make me actually, actually get it done. <laughs> I thought that was only me. Okay. Uh, no, sort of no. Like so now here I am telling the world again on, that I'm working on these books. Um, when I do author, like if I do little author visits for classrooms, I tell the kids and I ask them mm-hmm. to pray for me because I, they want more. But it's not really a continuation. It's um, a um, like a follow up, like this some of the same characters and it's a, like a little bit reading older reading level so it will be okay. another um and it's just a three books a series mm-hmm. um but um so for those yeah. who aren't as familiar with the gospel time checkers could you summarize them for us uh yes basically it's a um a little series they're easy reader level um which is like six to nine years old and it's mm-hmm. three siblings that go back in time to the time of Jesus. They meet different characters from the Gospels and hear their stories, how they've their lives have been changed by their own encounters with Jesus. They keep hoping to see Jesus. They keep mm-hmm. missing him. Spoiler alert, they get to see him in the last book. Um, and mm-hmm. then they at the end of each book, they come home back to our time. And each book ends with them um, going to Mass on Sunday and something clicks that they get about something in the mass because of what they've experienced oh, back on in time. Okay. And it's the, the six books are basically going through the life of Jesus. The first book is Bethlehem, and then mm-hmm. um, there the, the Galilean ministry. Then travel to Jerusalem. There's um, Jericho story. A Jerusalem story is the end, and they finally Fantastic. get to see Jesus. So, what was it like writing? Um writing a series and being able to go back and and keep exploring things like I think you mentioned it's similar to the magic tree house yeah. um That's, did you read a lot of the magic tree house and um, sort of I didn't read a lot of them I, I read the first couple of books and I mm-hmm. thought oh this is this would be a cool way to do stories of the gospel 
and um, Jack and Annie, the kids in the Magic Treehouse series, they they go back in time to like all different periods of time, dinosaurs, Shakespeare, whatever, but they do not go to the time of Jesus, very interestingly. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, oh, this would be a great way to do it. And I thought about it for, I went to look it up to see, I, I think it was four or five years I had the idea of doing mm -hmm. something like that, but I didn't read a lot of the se of that series. I just got the idea from it. Um, and then I wrote the entire series in NaNoWriMo 2009. <laughs> S sorry, <clears throat> the entire series of yeah, six, six books, books in yeah. one month? Well, it was five books and I added, in sorry, editing, five. I added another book into it. They're short. There you go, people. It can be done. <laughs> yes, yeah. So the five wow. books together was 50,000 words there because each book is about, uh, you know, about 10,000 words. So, mm -hmm. um, and then it took me four years of editing them. And the first three came out um, together and then the next three came out. So they came out like, uh, I think, 2014, something like that. So mm -hmm. it's been a few. So I've been trying to do another series since then. <laughs> I hear you. What was the um, hardest part about editing them? that you found? Um, well, I think for these, um, the research, um, doing accurate research was um, difficult in many places because this, they're in the time of Jesus. I had to find out, like, you can't just say, oh, they sat down and ate. Like, you have to say something about what food they're eating. Or, right. And then the last book, I was describing them in, um, um, in Jerusalem, and I'm like, uh, what they're walking down the street. What do they see? What do things look like? So what houses look like and all that kind of thing. And there's that model of Jerusalem that's in the Holy Land. So I was looking at that and maps and books and trying to picture, wow. well, if they're going up that street there, where would the temple be and what it would look like? You know, mm -hmm. so to make it, um, I really did a lot of research. Um, it would, it's harder if it's for older people. Younger is a little bit simpler, but I think that was probably the most challenging thing was to make it accurate. Um, mm -hmm. also like where in the city would things have happened, you know, gotcha. I tried I to get, I tried to, to convince people that I needed to go to the Holy land for research, but it didn't work <laughs> out. <laughs> See, now that would be perfect. Yeah. Uh, perfect excuse. It's fun. Um, it was a couple of years back. I tried writing my own time travel, uh, oh. series and it was actually Frangelico. Um, oh. meeting his guardian angel and then traveling back in time to orchestrate from behind the scenes, or I should say collaborate with God and the angels behind the scenes on some of the miracles of some of the saints. Oh. And, um, it's, it's completely wacky and very fun. And it's like Dr. Strange, maybe a little bit, but, um, that same sense of like having to do the research and, mm -hmm. and I set myself very strong parameters, like one story had to be completed every Saturday and I was only allowed one hour of research. You know, so wow. Google Earth was awesome yeah. for <laughs> very quickly looking up places and trying to guess and and then staying more focused on the story. And I'm, I'm curious, actually, about that when it comes to writing a novel or a story that has more history in it. Um, and then, like you said, I know it's an easier reader, but um, did you find sometimes there is a, a tension between like how much research to do versus what was actually needed for the story? You know how much backstory and history to actually work in uh how did you handle that sort of thing um well i think because my stories are so short i didn't really have too much trouble with like you know some i hear people say I, you do all this research so then you want to include it in there somehow so you yeah. do have to resist the temptation to describe unnecessarily mm -hmm. things that you just happen to know about but it but your reader doesn't need to know about or the characters um don't need to talk about um, but mm -hmm. I, I think, um, and if, and if you're using research just to procrastinate writing, that's another problem, but I think you really can't, yeah. uh, uh, you probably can't do too much in the sense of the more, um, you know, about something, um, mm -hmm. you can, it will, it will come through in the story. And, um, mm -hmm. since I'm a, I'm an editor, actually, I, um, I'm coming at this also, this conversation a lot thinking of, uh, as an editor, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of times where people don't do enough research and you're yeah. like, um, did you know, did you notice how, how can this work? This can't have worked at that time. This wouldn't have been that, the thing that we have today. It would have been in this kind of old version of it. Like, and you end up doing research for the author, which is not mm -hmm. a good sign. So 
I think you probably can't do too much research, but you can mm -hmm. put too much of it in your story. Definitely. Yeah. What a great, uh, what a great point. Um, I'm actually curious to go down that road with you as an editor. <clears throat> some rec maybe do you have some recommendations? You know, what are some things, I don't know, maybe if there's common flaws or, or sticking points that people just don't get right when it comes to writing, um, especially history and reference and stuff like that. Any recommendations? Um, I think over the years I've seen, I have seen um, the difficulty with like historical fiction. Um, mm -hmm. if, like time travel is, is kind of part historical fiction and part not um, part fantasy, like, but um, things with historical fiction, people just kind of like, oh, it's like, this is like a kind of like medieval feel or whatever. But, you know, mm -hmm. you, you can't, you have to either make it our world medieval um, and you can't throw in things that didn't exist at the time, or you have to make it a completely different world. But that's a lot, that's even more work than researching the reality, I think, um, okay. because again, you see like lack of that kind of world building, even if you're making it up, it's like research, but you're just, you're making it up yourself. You have to think through how would these, these like, these like modern things that happen at that time in that world, but like, how does that work? And what's the ramification of it? It should, even though it's not going to be all spelled out in your story, you really should know more about it. So I think sometimes there's, it's just people get excited and they write it, but that's your first draft. You have to go mm -hmm. back and do more. And sometimes it's fine to go through and write the story and, and then just put a note, like I have to find out what people ate at that time. Or I have to find out what clothes were like at that time and then just keep mm -hmm. writing. But then you do have to go back and research it. And yeah. it's much more rich and polished um, mm -hmm. when you read it and you can tell that people have done that work, I think. Yeah, no, definitely agree. I, saw, I came across an article this past week um, where an author pointed out, what did they say? They said, write the character's journey or their perspective. Uh, don't write the world building, you know, so describe what they're going to notice. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. a great way to stay inside their head and, and maybe not to world build more than is necessary, but you know, that way you can, you can hint at it, but you're not info dumping. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to know it, even if the, yes. even if the character doesn't refer to it or, or cause it's part of their world. Um, mm -hmm. it, otherwise there becomes holes, like, like, yeah. wait a minute, what, how does that work? You just can't throw in a cool thing and like, oh, it, it does that. You kind of, in your mind, you have to have at least some idea of how it works. Yep, I, I think this is yeah, one I of agree. the, um, for time travel, um, it's when the way it's, um, I think it's one of the reasons it's popular for kids is that, um, because the kids are coming from our time back then they don't mm -hmm. understand or know about a lot of stuff and it gives mm -hmm. occasion to explain things. Whereas if you try to write a story just about children in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, they, mm -hmm. the children would like, that's their life. You wouldn't, and you know, you wouldn't have occasion to explain to the reader things that they don't know. Whereas if mm -hmm. you have these characters coming, especially my youngest character, he's always asking questions like that are really, um, the, the people that are have no idea what he's talking about because he like he asked to borrow a stroller and yeah. they're like what and his older siblings have to say nothing never mind because that he doesn't get the difference but that's why um time travel is cool for kids because you can you have the occasion to explain that they would ask a question and they would have it explained to them mm -hmm. um yeah yeah no that's that's great i i love time travel and i think that's why those kinds of characters are so valuable is because they create that um that point of familiarity uh, within the story so that you can go to a strange place, but the characters or the readers get to go along mm -hmm. um, for that. Yeah. I'm curious about the, the news stories that you're working on. You don't have to reveal any details and so on, but I'm curious, is there a, as you mentioned, is for a slightly older audience, mm -hmm. um, what's the, uh, the, the, the objection or, or the resistance or the, the curiosity? Is it the fact that it's just, having being so busy or is it knowing that it's going to be more in depth and it's fleshing out the characters some more um yeah it's, and you can totally dismiss the question if you yeah want. no i i'm not really sure what the problem is um i think i it is like i have i've written a draft and it's not it doesn't have it doesn't have there's not enough to it um mm -hmm the ones that I did for younger kids, they have level, they have like layers to them that I think 
um, um, really, really make it rich for that level. But it's not enough for an older child. It needs to start being. Mm -hmm. And the, the time, the part of the story that's in our time, mm -hmm. in the gospel time checkers, there's very little time that they spend, you know, in right. our time in the story. It's just at the very beginning mm -hmm. and then the very end. But mm -hmm. mainly there, it's back in time. But now I have, it, I need to have more happening to them in, the, in our world before mm -hmm. they go back in time um, and yeah. make that a little more complicated of a story. Uh, mm -hmm. So for like for middle grade. Um, so that's right. what's taken me, that's what's making it difficult. Their journeys and their interactions and all that. A little more of that, that inner life and those inner questions yeah. and, the and then journey. it's basically writing two complete stories at the same time because you have their time here and what's happening and then back in time a whole nother set of characters and the what's the plot of what's happening then so it's mm -hmm. like... i assume that you've read stories or submissions that have maybe kind of done this or done it poorly um and maybe putting aside your you know stuff that you're writing um where have you seen people get lost in Maybe we'll just start there in starting their stories in how much time to spend in the beginning before getting into the part that's actually important. I find a lot of us spend just way too much time in the first two chapters, maybe not doing anything really interesting. And you could just edit those right out and start with, you know, a little further on or something. Any thoughts along those lines? Yeah, I think when you go to just write, it's fine to take as much time as you need to get into it. But like you said, when you go back to edit, it, you have to figure out really where the story starts. And um, I, I'm definitely learning this too. Um, um, as an editor, sometimes you can say, well, you, could, you, you know it when you see it. It's easier to recognize it than to actually write it, in my opinion. Right. Um, there's, and there's some really good books um, that help with this, I think, like uh, Save the Cat, um, mm -hmm. uh, actually I read the Save the Cat Writes a novel, the not the version that's, um, by another author adapted to novel writing. Um, mm -hmm. those kind of things help with, that, especially that opening kind of thing. But for the begin, for the actual writing, it's, I think it's just, just write. And you might have to figure out by writing where, where, what happens at the beginning when it actually mm -hmm. starts. No, I think that's absolutely true. I just, this month. Um, speed read through that same book, Save the Cat, oh, writes yeah. a novel. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm more slowly going through it because I'm trying to muster up uh, my own courage to actually write or get back into writing. So I, I kind of feel you with the, the hesitancy to really get back into committing, but there's also just a joy there of actually writing the thing. And I love, I'm really loving this book for the, the formula it provides mm -hmm. and really forcing you to think a little deeper. And the story just becomes, it does become so much richer so much better paced. So um, I'm curious if you had a, uh, you, you had mentioned having your favorite legend or, you know, uh, the favorite story and you mentioned Lord of the Rings was apart from the hobbits, was there an, a story arc or a character in there that, that really spoke to you uh, growing up? Um, or maybe it was the, the actual hobbits themselves. I think, I, I think it was always Frodo and Sam. That was the main thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I always, I think that's like who, that's who, well, that's how it's written. Like the, actually I think Sam is the main character through most of it. Um, but I think I always felt it from their point of view reading mm -hmm. the stories. Yeah. I remember someone once describing, I don't know if this actually was true or not, but it was in a, like a literary technique Tolkien used was, <clears throat> excuse me, instead of creating one Hobbit with four characteristics he split it into four hobbits with one characteristic um as a really well it's a very helpful way to create dialogue and interaction and so on i would imagine you've kind of done the same sort of thing with your own trilogy or trinity of characters uh the the three siblings um it, i'm curious if you have any words of advice especially as an editor but also as a creator for people who write stories maybe where there's one character um, and think about the value of, of that technique of having multiple characters, even for the benefits of, I don't know, conversations and talking about things rather than thinking about them. Um, anything there? Yeah, I think, um, I think it would be very hard to, to write. Uh, I don't, I, I don't think any of my books I've had, well, I have had, um, 
yeah, to write just one character that doesn't have a lot of interaction, that would be very hard because they're, they'll be in their head the whole time. Um, but it's also hard to, um, if you have multiple characters, there still needs to be like a main character um, mm -hmm. or at most like two. Um, for my um, for my gospel time checkers, it's um, the oldest is a girl and then um, Hannah and then Caleb and Noah is the youngest. So Caleb is telling the story. It's it's written in first person and he's mm -hmm. telling it. So he's the main character. But um, it works to have like an older sister and a younger brother because sometimes it's like kind of like the boys like against their and sometimes it's like the older ones against the little one, you know, like not against, but like their the way of thinking is like sometimes he's kind of on the same wing, wavelength on each side so it works mm -hmm. with that um i have seen um submissions where it's not there's like three siblings actually another book but for much older uh three siblings and um in real life but they um you really need none of them are the main character they're each have their they're like alternating chapters first person from each one um, and uh, it starts to be difficult because you feel like you need to kind of feel for one of them um, and you keep being pulled around. So I, it, sometimes you really do have to pick one and be, to be the main character and the others are supporting characters. I think that's a fantastic tip. So if, if you're, you're watching this now, and especially on YouTube, please go ahead and hit like. It does help more people to hear about Sister Maria. Um, you know, like I've n never met the, the nun behind the pros before. So it's uh, fun just meeting you and, and so on. Um, I do want to ask about uh, your writing process, um, how it was or maybe how it is now. Uh, before getting to that, this interview, it's, it's an insight. It's a preview of the kind of community and the conversations that we're building within the Catholic author community. Um, it's a, a place where modern fiction writers can give and get feedback, uh, share your insights and your works in progress and build a network of supportive friends, plus a whole lot more. So please do come check us out at catholicauthor.us. Um, sister, how did, what's your writing process like? Um, and well, has okay. it changed in the few years since you wrote one versus today? Well, like I said, right now, there's not much process happening. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, but when it works, um, like I, I, I did, I was going on it, you know, I was working on it for a while when it works to me, for me, it works best if I do a little bit every day, um, okay. because keeping it fresh in my mind like that, the story and the characters and what I was thinking about, what I was, what, what like point was happening or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. if I have it, um, something that I work on each day a little bit, then um, somehow ideas pop up more in my mind and like just when I'm walking or doing something like I'll be like thinking about it and like ideas will come whereas if I work on it and put it aside for too many days it starts to be mm -hmm. kind of out of my mind and then when I go back I have to refresh myself again so for me it works it, it's helpful if I can do a little mm -hmm. bit every day or almost every day and I did develop that a little bit with NaNoWriMo when I did NaNoWriMo you have mm -hmm. to write like a lot, you have to write basically every day or almost every day. Otherwise you won't win. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, when you do sit down and write, is it for a long period at a stretch? Do you have a word count? Do you like to play music or is it silent? What's the um, environment like? I, I, um, not a, I usually can't get huge periods of time, um, mm -hmm. unless I'm, you know, on vacation or something, but, um, like in the, usually more in the morning, um, um, an hour or less at a time and I don't I can't use music I um it's too too much it's kind of too much in my head I I guess once in a while I would do something just instrumental but that that doesn't have any melody that I know or anything like that if I mm -hmm. if I need to block out um some other noise or something um and I um I like to have a cup of coffee or something like that and um yeah I don't know what else to say that would be helpful as far as writing process. I'm looking for tips, actually. <laughs> when um, when you do write, is it um, is it kind of a stream of consciousness sort of thing, or do you try to write a clean edit the first time? You know, being that you're also an editor, does that impact how you um, sort of just get in the zone? Yeah, it's not. I, I try not to um, edit too much as I'm writing. 
but mm -hmm. I have like what I'm working on now, I have done drafts and I have outlines and stuff. So now I need to do a little more than stream of consciousness, which is like the, mm -hmm. f the first time through. I've already done mm -hmm. that. So now I'm more like rewrite. I guess I, what I'm doing right now is more rewriting. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm figuring out where I have, um, I need more complexity or a little bit more of the story um, mm -hmm. and in both world, both in our time and back in time, both places need mm -hmm. a little more um, details built up. Um, so do you I'm, like to, given that you are doing so much research, do you do a lot of plotting ahead of time or do you do just enough to kind of get back in the zone and keep writing? I've, I've become more of a plotter now. I, I, I'm realizing okay. um, it, it saves a lot of time to, to get more, at least a, a little more of an outline and a plan. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, you, you can, you, you depart from it at the the drop of an idea. Like it's not like anything you stick to, but, um, for me, if I just try to, my, on NaNoWriMo, I did that several times a few years mm -hmm. back. And just like, if I have nothing in mind, it, it comes out with, um, kind of a mess at the end. But if I have, a, at least mm -hmm. I know where, at least I need to know where I'm going, like where I want it mm -hmm. to end up so that I have something more usable. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. When, when you, um, you know, coming up with an idea or even just kicking one around or, or even committing to one. Are you, how do I say, are you inspired by the, the end of the story? You know where it's got to, or it's going to end up, or is there like an inciting incident that, that gets you going and, and then you want to write to find out where the end goes? Do your endings change as you get through the books? Um, I think I, I'm mostly my experience of of um, what I've written, like the only thing of fiction that I've published is the Gospel Time Trekkers, but I have a few other mm -hmm. drafts. Mostly, I have, and I have like an ending, like I mm -hmm. at least a feeling of what I, how I want people to feel at the end. Um, okay. Uh, the characters, how I want them to, maybe not all the details of it, but I, I think I write more toward that ending than, um, mm -hmm. and then I have to figure out. The beginning is hard to figure out how where you go back to to start it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I find beginnings are a challenge. Actually, what is a, what's a, a tip or a recommendation that you found? And let's stick with, you know, the, the trackers and writing for a younger age range. What's a, a tip that you found that helps kick off the books to a compelling beginning? Um, I think if you like, think about what little kids like to read, you really need some you need some dialogue really quickly. You mm. can't have like paragraphs of description or yeah. paragraphs of uh, the main character um, thinking and um, like being inside their head and thinking about how how mad they are about something or how how terrible things are or whatever. You can't have that for too much. You need to pretty quickly get into a little bit of dialogue or action or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. There's a series of novels that um, I'm reading to my little girl. We have story time every night for about a half hour, and it's a British author, and she's written like just numbers of different series and stuff. But one thing that does stand out is uh, for that age range, there's a big focus on food, fun, and friendships as sort of a, tr a, a, a three areas of focus. And there's, there's not a lot of inner life going on. There really isn't with little kids either. Um, there's not a lot of a journey, you know, going on. Maybe there's a lesson to be learned, but not even all the time. It's, it's very much, oh, here's an adventure we're going on, which is part of the fun category. And there's a regular return to how do we nourish ourselves and enjoy that? Mm -hmm. And how are we all friends? And maybe we lost a friend or we're gaining a friend. And, and I'm thinking back to me being that age. It's like, those were the only things I was interested in. Um, yeah. 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 The idea of adventure, like I talk about my books and I say they go back in time and they have adventures. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, adventures for, you know, a seven year old is different than an adventure for a teenager. It doesn't have right. to be um, there needs to be like a little bit of danger, but it has to be of a very specific sort. So mm -hmm. I had to figure out six different types of small danger that could happen in my books. <laughs> um, well, actually one of the drafts from NaNoWriMo, I had 
way too kidnapping, but that was like, no, no, that's way too much. No way. <laughs> uh, so it has to be like, um, you know, there's a, a storm and it's lightning and they're lost or something, you know, mm -hmm. but then they find somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. or they, um, it's, they're fishing at night and he falls o over the edge of the boat, you know, so mm -hmm. it's a brief, brief, like, um, brief danger, but that's not, um, prolonged or extreme. Um, right. so you knew, need a little bit of that, that makes the adventure and then, mm -hmm. and then what happens after whatever. Right. But it's like, it's like the risk needs to be only 1% more than their capacity. Yeah. You know? yeah. Whereas <laughs> like an adult world level of danger for that age range, like you said, kidnapping is, yeah. it's insurmountable for. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. One, well, starting to wrap up sister, how can people get in touch maybe with you, if you're sharing some of your writing journey or maybe to get in touch with the, the, the tracker series? Where can they find you online? Um, well, I right now I don't have a website. We're in the middle of like redoing all of our online websites. But I am on Instagram. Um, my handle is um, at Sister Maria Grace, Sister spelt out S I S T E R. Um, and um, I'm very active there. And actually, I've been posting like writers tips from an editor point of view about oh, um, writing and about getting published with a traditional publisher, which mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm realizing like people actually need to be convinced to even try it because now self-publishing has become such a thing and so mm -hmm. easy um, that people are, you know, like they don't even think it's worth trying to get published by a traditional publisher. So I okay. plug that and the advantages of it and like tips for that. Um, and, um, yes, I, um, I also, I'm going to be at the, um, the Catholic Writers Guild there, mm -hmm. um, um, the CMN, the, um, which is a, um, publishers at, um, for Catholic bookstores. And they, at that same time, they have the Catholic Writers Guild has a little, um, workshop thing. So I'm going to be at that. Um, so if anyone is at that, but, um, on Instagram, you can direct message me or, and see, I have a hashtag you can hit and see all of those posts and I'm doing it with another sister who um, is another who is also an editor so we're kind of trying to like um, encourage more submissions like show say what we want what we're looking for and give mm -hmm. tips based on what we what we see and what the needs are so I think that I think be. that's excellent C could I ask you to share one tip like maybe your number one reason why people should consider traditional publishing especially with you uh, as opposed to going through, um, you know, like many of our other authors have done and myself included, which is just the, the self-publishing route. So what would be a, a number one tip? Well, I think the number one is that um, to realize the great benefit you get from having an editor um, and designers um, and all of the people that work on your book, and they're all there the, no as self publishing you find these other people you could hire them individually or through a company or whatever but mm -hmm. but for a traditional publisher we are invested in your book working out becoming the best it could be and succeeding because yeah. um that's the only way that we can make it ends meet um mm -hmm. a traditional publisher pays the author and and all the other forms of publishing, the author pays the publisher. So they get yeah. something, but the publisher for a traditional publisher, we, we don't get anything unless the book people buy the book. So the marketing, the pub, the editing, everything is all in, we're all invested in making your book the best it can be. And I think people have a, the fear that like they lose control or whatever. They can't, you know, they can't do their own, pick their own illustrator and all that. But it's all people who have great experience doing this, who are, who are mm -hmm. working, who want the best. And we do everything in collaboration with the author. Beautiful. What is there an age range that you specialize in with your press? Um, well, we publish kids and adult books, but for fiction, we only do kids. So picture books all the way up to YA, but we don't publish okay. adult fiction. And then YA, like that age range would be uh, 13 through 15 yeah. Um, well, I mean, it could be 13 through 18, like teenagers, but mostly it probably would be the younger side, like you said, 13 through 15. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, sister. This oh, is always welcome. my favorite part of every episode is to ask if you had uh, a one minute to share a message of encouragement to other Catholic authors, what would you like to say? 
Um, well, also this, I think I'm I'm speaking as an editor too. I can't help but to to really say I really encourage you to keep writing, keep working at the craft of writing, and not be not be satisfied with your first draft or your second draft, but like to really get get it to the, the best that it can be, and um, and I and and as a as a Catholic and to all the Catholic writers um, to see the work that um, you're doing and writing as a way of collaborating with God and getting the good news out there. And it doesn't have to be overtly in the actual, you know, quotes from the gospel in your book. Um, but the, the way of just the way of telling a story um, is at, coming from a person of faith and um, that is a way of collaborating with, with the message of the good news. So keep doing it. <laughs>